Well, greetings, Tube fans, or Valve fans, depending on where you live. May I present to you an operational RCA SB256, uh, sometimes called a Selectron. I'm going to put a couple of uh, other common tubes in the shot here, just to give you an idea how large this thing is. This is a 6L6. This guy is a 12AX7. And you just sort of see how impressively large this thing is. And just sort of staring at it, you can kind of see this is quite complicated inside. Now the magic happens when I turn out the lights, so hang on. Let's pull these tubes out of the shot. What you're looking at is an electrostatic memory tube. This tube predates magnetic core memory by a couple of years, and once magnetic core memory was introduced, that pretty much made this guy obsolete. My microprocessor is going through and writing bits high and then going through and writing bits low. The apparent pauses that you see are when it's actually writing to the other side. And as I'm staring at this thing, I notice there may be a bit that may be bad, but that's okay. The goal of my series of videos here is to demonstrate or explain uh, the physics behind the operation of this tube is, is quite interesting. How do we write by value information? That is ones or zeros. How do I select individual bits? That sort of thing. This tube has some impressive electrical engineering on the inside of it. I'm going to go through that as well. So in this introductory video, what I plan to do is go through the data sheet, patent information, other tech reports, and kind of give you an idea of the voltages that we're going to need to run this tube and some idea of the timing uh, signals that is uh, to drive the tube. So let's get started. Before we get too far along, I'd like to acknowledge the work that Charles Osborne put into this website. He has a lot of uh, good background information, theory information. I drew all of my technical information from what's posted here, uh, particularly uh, these, these patents and also in the technical reports, particularly, let's get down to it. This one right here, the RCA Review Technical Report was very good. And this data sheet uh, was also very instrumental in mapping out the pins for this project. So I just wanted to give uh, Charles Osborne uh, some acknowledgement for putting together a most excellent website. So let's take a real quick tour of the physical structure of this thing. I'll go over it again with diagrams and cartoons and so forth. But I'm going to start here. Um, these uh, little square rods, these are the horizontal selection bars. They're part of the process in, in selecting the bits. And if you can just peer inside this um, mica insulator, inside these holes, you'll see cylindrical uh, conductors. These are the individual eyelets or storage bits. Now let's come around to the other side, the back, the display side of the tube. Hang on while my camera tries to focus. There we go. So the back side of this guy is called the Faraday cage. You can see the uh, individual windows for display bit status, these windows, these are not the in, actually the, the bits that get stored. These are just visual indications. The window is coated with uh, willamite, which is a zinc silicate. It's not a phosphor. And we're going to take the camera up a little bit higher here. There we go. So up here at the top, you can make out vertical selection bars. Uh, they're very similar to the horizontal selection bars. They're actually a little bit larger. Um, and in between each selection bar, you can make out cathodes and their heaters just sticking up out of that. So what we're going to do next is go through uh, uh, cross-sectional diagrams and cartoons of this thing and explain what each bit does. So let's go through the internal structure of this tube in a bit more detail. The technical information I'm pulling from is this uh, RCA tech report or review. This patent, both of which are authored by the inventor, Jan Rackman, I believe that's how you pronounce it, and of course the data sheet. All of these uh, discuss the internal structure. They all provide some suggestion for potentials, and I will uh, show you which potentials I settled on. But this is a cross section of the tube. We kind of see uh, the glass envelope around it. The first thing I wanna point out are these little black bits right here, these are our, our cathodes. So I'll just sort of make a little note right here. These are our cathodes. 
So the structures that I have highlighted in yellow, this guy, these two bars, these are our selection bars. Notice that the tube is symmetric about the center line, about the cathodes. There's a side A, a side B. So uh, we can run uh, the tube. I mean, there's, there's 256 bits. We can work on one side or the other, but I'm just going to discuss um, the right side here. I'll call it side A, but that doesn't matter so much. Our next structure I've colored in green. This is the collector plate. The collector will tend to collect uh, most of the electron current that's emitted by these uh, cathodes, but there are some small holes for some current to get through. The collector also provides a reference potential for our next structure, and our next structure are these islets. I'll just color this guy right here real quick. This is our storage bit. These are the things that will hold our by-value information. And it's important to point out, these guys are electrically isolated. Our next structure I've colored in blue. This is our right plate. And as you might imagine, the right plate is used for writing. Our next structure is this sort of pink, red, I guess, if you will. Um, this is used for reading. So we'll call it the reed plate. And I might point out that this is a control. We don't actually read any signals from this. Finally, we have a Faraday cage. That is this entire structure that I have highlighted in blue. And in all of this, we have, starting from our cathodes, there are, there are holes for electron currents to, to get through. We can control how much gets through, and I'll discuss that in a moment. But on the back side of the Faraday cage, we have windows coated in willemite. This is a zinc silicate uh, material. It fluoresces whenever electrons hit it with enough energy. But it provides a visual, visual indication of, of the bit status. So let's look at sort of a cartoon drawing of this thing and look at this in greater detail. So here we have sort of a, a cartoon version of the, of the cross-sectional diagram, just focusing in on three bits of the device. We'll start with the cathodes. Again, these are um, heated. We have our thermionically emitted electrons. The bias potential for this sets the potential for everything. So we might as well make this zero volts or ground. Next, we have our vertical and horizontal selection bars. This is, of course, drawn in cross-section. But just imagine we've got these bars coming up in and out of the page. Horizontal selection bars, I have a stack of these. And, this, and what we're trying to do is get the electrons through the spaces in between them. So for the moment, let's assume that these guys are all at zero volts. That allows current to come in between each of the bars and I'm sort of spraying current everywhere. Most of this current will get collected by the collector, fancy name. This thing is biased at 180 volts and I will tend to collect something on the order of 100 milliamps of current. This potential, the collector potential, sort of sets a reference for the islets. And again, the islets are electrically isolated. The islets will find themselves in one of two possible states. And I'm going to cover the physics of the islet in video three, but for now, let's just say the two possible potentials are either near zero volts or near the collector potential of 180 volts. So if the islet finds itself at 180 volts, there is a channel, a pathway, for electron currents come through. It's a small amount of current, but if I have current, I will associate that with a digital one or a high. If on the other hand, I have my islet at zero volts, very little current will come through and I will associate that as a digital zero or a low. Now, 
the selection process uh, is important for whenever we write and read. So I'm going to come back to our selectors. And in the idle state of the tube, this needs to be at zero volts so that I have this constant uh, electron current, electron spray everywhere, uh, maintaining um, these potentials. When I want to write or read, I need to, and the word I'm going to use is deselect all bits except the one I'm interested in. So to deselect bits or bars, um, what I have to do is apply a very negative potential. So let's say we've connected uh, a switch to this selection bar. We're going to provide our idle potential, zero volts here. So normally we would have this switch in that position. If I want to deselect uh, this bar, what I need to do is throw this switch uh, to minus 250 volts. Now, the selection process and how I address which bar does what will come into play in video two. Let's say we want to do a write. I want to use the write plate now. So the idle potential for the write plate is zero volts, but the process of writing, we will need to pulse it. So let's connect the right plate to a switch. Again, the idle potential is zero volts. That's sort of the normal state. The process of writing, what I do is I deselect all the bits except for the one I'm interested in. And then I pulse the right plate to positive 360 volts. I just I throw this switch. Now, the islets are isolated. And the only way I can change their potentials is through capacitively coupled displacement current. Now the, the timing of this right pulse with respect to uh, deselecting the bit that I had during this process will determine whether I end up with a one or a zero. And again, I'm gonna cover this later. I will do this in video three. The read plate. Let's assume for the moment, this is 150 volts. With it being so positive, if I have electron current coming through a high or a, a status high, status one, 180 volt islet, I have electron current coming through, it is then accelerated towards the Faraday cage because we're going to bias this very positive. Uh, the data sheet says you can use anything from 300 to 800, I believe. I settled on 420, 450 volts. So this current will come in, sailing through. We have enough energy once we hit our screen to produce photons. It fluoresces a little bit. And that gives me a visual indication of this bit being high. On the other hand, replayed at positive 150. If we have a, a, a digital low or zero volts here, we have no current coming through. And this would appear as a dark spot. This, in this process, uh, we've got sort of a visual indication of bit status, but if I'm trying to electronically read from the memory, I need an electronic process of getting my information. And this is where the read plate comes in. If I'm trying to do an electronic read, the idle potential for this read plate needs to be negative. So we will start there. Minus 50, minus 100 volts. I think that I settled on minus 100. So even if I have a high bit here, if my read plate is this negative, minus 100 volts, I will not get this current coming through. This read plate acts a lot like the grid in a triode. So the read process, what I do is I deselect every bit except for the one I'm interested in, the one I'm trying to pull. So I deselect everything except for the one I want. I then pulse my read plate to positive 150, like this. I get a pulse of current coming through. I get a pulse of light, which I no longer care about. But these electrons coming in will then eject secondary electrons. And I can attract them to these read sense wires if I bias these guys at an additional, it's supposed to be a big delta, 100 to 200 volts above the Faraday cage. 
So if this is a high, I get current coming through, I get secondaries, and on the read sense wire, I'm going to draw just a little graph here, I would expect a little, little bit of current in coincidence with this read pulse. On the other hand, if I selected a bit that was low and I did this process, I would not, here, let's just draw it over here, I would not get a little pulse if I try to read from this. So that's how we would determine whether a bit is high or low. I, I deselect everything except for the one I'm interested in. I pulse the read plate, and then I look to see if I've got a pulse of current or not. I will cover this in video four. So we have a game plan here for the potentials that we need. Let me just kind of go through this again. Vertical selection bar zero or minus 250 volts. Collector is fixed at 180, 100 milliamps. That's really the only thing that has significant current on it. The right plate, the yellow state is zero volts. And if I'm trying to write, I need to pulse this to positive 360. The read plate, the, if I'm just interested in a visual display, I will leave it at 150. On the other hand, if I'm trying to do an electronic read, we will also need minus 150. And this would be the idle state. And I would pulse to 150 positive 150. Well, I think I said minus 100. That's, let's just do that. Gray to cage at 420. And then the read sense needs to be in an, an additional 100 to 200 volts above this guy. Now that we have a game plan, let's look at sort of a block diagram of how this might play out. Here we have my take on the schematic of this tube. You see an array of selection bars and their connections to the outside world. Um, we have our indirectly heated cathode, which is at ground or zero volts. The filament happens to be center tapped and I'm essentially running the two halves in parallel with the center at ground. I will need 180 volts for the collector, over 400 for the Faraday, I'm running 420, 425. We will need uh, for the selection process, minus 250 and zero. The write process, 360 and zero. The read process, I will need positive 150. I will leave it here for if I'm only interested in a video, or excuse me, a visual display, or let's change that to minus 100 if I'm trying to do an electronic read. So in video two, uh, I will cover the decoding scheme. That is, if I wanna select a particular bit, let's say I want that one, what potentials do I put on all of these bars to make that happen? Do I put zero? Do I put uh, minus 250 or what? So the decoding scheme and also uh, my solution for a bar driver will be, will be presented in video three. Uh, the game plan is to control everything here from the dotted line uh, to the left here with just simple TTL 74 LS logic. So it's not going to be super fast, but all of this, the decoding, the driving, how I select the bit, all of this will be in video two. The write process, uh, I will cover the, the driver for reading and writing in video three. Finally, we have uh, this thing being controlled by a PEC microcontroller. Uh, this guy will be easy to reprogram and change the behavior of, of the whole circuit. In the introductory sequence, all I had this guy doing is just go through each bit, make it all high, go through again, make it all low, and just sort of repeat that ad infinitum. So this is our game plan uh, for the circuits that will be presented in later videos. Thanks for watching.